Hello guys and welcome to another live session for uh, A to P5. So this is uh, P5 session number six, uh, if I remember correctly. So we are done with, uh, so we are done with the 2022, the most recent year. And now we move back uh, to 2021. So this is the first paper from that year, which we are, uh, which we are going to be looking at, which is March 21, paper 52. Right. So let's start. So let's have a look at the first question. So this is the first question. A student investigates the vertical oscillations of a solid cylinder which floats in cooking oil, right? This part is important, is that it is floating in the oil. Figure 1.1 shows a cylinder of radius R. The student places a cylinder of mass M in the oil. The cylinder is displaced vertically from its uh, equilibrium position and released so that it oscillates. The time period T of the oscillations is determined. A number of different masses, a number of cylinders of different mass are available, right? So again, if you just think about what you are doing is that you are changing the mass and you are noting the period of the oscillations. So just by a careful reading of this paragraph, you can uh, deduce that you are varying m, the mass of the cylinder, and you are measuring the period of oscillations. So it is suggested that the relationship between T and m is given by this equation where sigma is the density of the oil and k is a constant. Design a lab experiment to test the relationship between T and M. Explain how your results would be used to determine a value for K. So first off, let's just go uh, down and talk about the problem. So in properly defining the problem, we would say that vary M, the mass of the cylinder and measure capital T. Right, And as for the control variable, so everything in your equation, which is not a constant or not a part of this relationship is your control variable. So sigma and R, the radius. So you would say keep sigma and R constant, right? If you write control sigma and R, you would again lose marks. So keep sigma and R constant. Right, so this is done. Now on to the experimental diagram for this uh, experiment. So you know that you are changing the mass. So obviously there isn't a problem in you explaining how the, so how you're going to change your independent variable, right? So you just use different cylinders. But then uh, the question is actually measuring the time. Right, so this is going to be immersed in cooking oil as well. So we know that as for a lab experiment, you would then need a beaker in which you have the oil and then you would, uh, and in that uh, oil, this uh, cylinder would be floating. And then with some uh, displacement, it would be oscillating. And here, uh, since uh, now we're on the subject of the displacement, this also says the cylinder is displaced vertically from its equilibrium position and released. So that is it oscillates. So another control variable we could write here is that we should also keep the initial displacement of the cylinder constant. So also keep the initial displacement of the cylinder constant. Right, so just write as many dis, uh, details as you can keep the initial displacement of cylinder 
constant. Right. So we were talking about the fact that, uh, so the experimental diagram, so you would have some sort of a method to displace it. Maybe you are, and again, it just totally depends on you. So you can just displace it slightly with your finger and then you can have it oscillate. And then after it oscillates, you also measure the period of the oscillations. So for measuring the period, you would use a stopwatch, right? Uh, anything other than that, again, if you just think about the previous papers we did with the copper sheet, which was oscillating. So again, the same problem with the light gate would be that how would you actually have the light beam be interrupted, right? So that is a problem. So the better way, which is not necessarily the most accurate way, but better as from the perspective of the examiner in which you would get marks is if you write that you would use a stopwatch or a timer to measure the oscillations. Again, with any experiment that has oscillations, you can always talk about the fact that you time multiple oscillations and average, right? So first, before talking about the additional detail part, let's just first make the diagram. So you would definitely have a beaker. So let's just draw that. Then let's say this is your workbench. So this is the work bench. You have this sort of uh, beaker. This is your beaker. It's filled with the cooking oil. And then you have your cylinder immersed in it, right? So it, uh, so the way you also draw the cylinder is important because above in the question you were told that this cylinder is floating, right? So if you draw it perfectly above outside this, uh, what do you call it? Outside of this cooking oil, that would be incorrect. Or if you draw it as such that it's entirely below, then that would be incorrect as well. So position like this is what I'm going to draw, right? That this is floating in water. What else do we have? So let's just, Go up and see if you're missing any piece of information. So obviously you would have uh, the stopwatch or the timer, or again, uh, you could also say that you are going to time this. Uh, so you are going to make a video of this and then you play this back frame by frame to measure the, what do you call it? So to measure the time period. So here I'm thinking, uh, and maybe this is too much detail, but again, no problem if I can get marks for it. So to keep the initial displacement constant, I can use some sort of a fiducial marker, which would allow me to give uh, allow me to give this uh, cylinder the same displacement each time. So let's say I am also now going to incorporate a retort stand, right? So let's do this. So this is. Let's say this is my retort stand. So with the help of a clamp, Right, so I could have some sort of a 
vertical fiducial marker, or let's say I have something like a pen here. So So let's say this is my fiducial marker. Right. And this is what I am going to use and also helping me time the oscillations. Right. So again, I could also have a mark somewhere over here. Right. Just to help me time the oscillations. But this fiducial marker is going to help me in giving it the same uh, displacement, the same initial displacement each time. So let's say this is moving up and down. So I'm going to use this uh, to give it the same displacement each time. So maybe I have it like almost touching the cylinder and then I dip it uh, down here. So then I can make sure in this way that I always give it the same displacement, right? So. I can also have uh, now the final piece of the uh, puzzle, which is the timer, right? Let me just go above and see if anything is left. Yeah, so there's all that is. So you could have the timer. So timer. So I guess that's all there is, right? So the fiducial marker, again, it's all, always up to you as to what else you can have uh, labeled here. What else uh, you need to incorporate that depends on your own experimental method. So this I should label as the cooking oil in red that's my retort stand and clamp so clamp and retort stand so this is done right so this is my experimental setup so now uh, i can talk about this so how do you now Actually, so let's say you've carried out this experiment. So for the plotting of the data, you would also need to measure the control variables, right? So we said that you can measure uh, T using a stopwatch or a timer. And now you need to talk about measuring the mass of the cylinder, right? So for the mass of the cylinder, this is uh, technically not a control variable, but again, you would have to measure it. So measure, M using a top pan balance, or you can also write an electronic balance. Both of these are pretty much the same, except for how they actually work. But again, uh, we, we are not interested in the working right now. We are just doing a practical. So you can write either of them. So measure the mass using a top pan balance. And if we think about measuring uh, this uh, mass, so you can again have this. So if we are measuring the mass of the top pan balance, right? So we can also say that you measure the mass, but we actually can't say that because the cylinder, the mass of the cylinder is changing. Otherwise I would say uh, doing this again and repeating the experiment, but I really can't say that here. So measure M using a top pan balance, what else is left? So now we have sigma and the radius. So sigma is the density. So I can't obviously directly measure it. So I would have to suggest a method of calculating it. So for density of oil, So for density of oil, if I think about it, so rho is the symbol for density. Density is mass per unit volume. So I would need the mass as well as the volume, right? So for the mass, <laughs> I would do this, that I would do the same thing that I would use a top pan balance, but to measure the mass of oil and, the, and to measure the mass of any liquid, 
I would say that I would measure mass of empty beaker. and measure mass of beaker plus oil. And then you subtract to get the mass of the oil. Right. So this is done. And then if you talk about the volume of oil, so for the volume, you already have the beaker. So you can just talk about uh, measuring the volume through the beaker, right? Or you can say that you, so actually a beaker, so a better instrument to use than a beaker would be use a measuring cylinder, right? So use measuring cylinder or you can also write something like a burette that would also be an experiment uh, that would also be an acceptable option so use a measuring cylinder or you can also write something like a burette i think the spelling is wrong to measure volume. And use density equals mass upon volume. So this is done. So we found the density as well. What else was there? So the radius, right? So obviously if you think about it in, when you are practically conducting an experiment, you cannot just find the radius directly, right? So even if you use a micrometer, which would obviously be a better choice than a vernier caliper, you can't directly find the radius, right? So first you would measure the diameter of the cylinder from the end to end. And again, for the measurement of the diameter, you can say that take the diameter at different points and average, and then uh, you could take that value and divide it by two to get the radius, right? So measure diameter using a micrometer at different points along the cylinder and average and then to go to the radius you would say r would be average diameter upon two right so this is done and then what else can you have so i think all of this is done all the control variables are measured independent dependent variables are also measured so I should have just written the line here that measure T using stopwatch or a timer. And while measuring T, we could have said that the uh, time multiple oscillations
So while timing, you can just say instead of multiple, it's better to talk about one concrete time. So let's say we time 10 oscillations and divide by 10. for the time of one oscillation. And whenever doing oscillations experiment, you can also talk about the fact that obviously it's going to be uh, difficult to actually time the oscillations, right? So you can also say that you wait for the oscillations to become even or steady. So it's not like just as you displace this, just as you displace this, it isn't necessary that you start timing at the same time. Right, so you wait for these to become steady and then you start timing. So this could also be one potential improvement. So this is done. Now, if you're talking about the graph, so what would be plotted against what? So this is the equation you have. So you were supposed to calculate the value of K and was there something else? Yeah, just K. So here, if you linearize this equation and again, uh, M is what you are varying, right? So right now there's a square root on the M. So you can also say that you plot T versus the square root of M, but that just becomes very complicated, right? Your gradients and y-intercepts would also be very complicated. So you would say that if I square both of these sides, this would become four pi m upon sigma k r squared, right? So t is the thing you are, this is the dependent variable. So this could be on the y-axis, right? So t square would be on the y-axis m is the independent variable. So all of this could be on the x-axis and then everything else which remains is the gradient, right? So I would say this, that the gradient is four pi upon sigma k r square. But again, this is not enough. You need to make the constant the subject of your equation. So k is 4 pi upon gradient times sigma r square. And again, you can always say this, that the relationship is valid. And in this case, I think this is the first example we've seen where we actually don't have a y-intercept. So you can say that the relationship is valid if the graph is a straight line passing through the origin. Only in this case, because there is no y-intercept. So relationship is valid if straight line passing through origin. Right, so that is uh, this question. So now we can talk about a bit of the additional details as well. So we can talk about, so first off, let's talk about the safety considerations. So the problem is this, is that this uh, cooking oil, so this could spill, right? So how could you pr uh, protect against these spillages? So you can talk about that, or you can also talk about uh, this being slippery. So you can also talk about using gloves to prevent your hands and coming in direct contact with the oil. So use gloves. To avoid direct contact with hands.
and then you can also talk about the fact that uh so what else could we talk about so we can just talk about the fact that weight or oscillations to become steady oscillations to become steady or and by the way you can also add that point about having the so timing the cylinder moving so making a video of the cylinder moving and then you play it back frame by frame to actually uh, calculate the time of oscillation from that right so that could be an additional detail so in this uh, particular one, we wrote a lot of additional detail above uh, while we were writing the main body of the answer as well, which is why we have a bit less uh, detail here, right? But this is also sufficient. Now let's go on to question number two. So a student investigates the collision of uh, two gliders A and B on a linear air track. So let's just skip through this and then we'll come back to this whenever we feel the need to. So let's start from here. It is suggested that the velocity V of the glider B as it passes through the light gate and M are related by this equation, where A is the mass of the glider A, right? So this uh, V uh, is the velocity of glider B and M is the mass of A, right? And this uh, U is some constant velocity of the glider A, right? So a graph is plotted of V one upon V on the y-axis against M upon against M on the x-axis. So if I have to make this uh, in looking in something like one upon V, so I can just cross multiply. So this equation would become one upon V equals M plus A upon two U A. Right. So now if I think about it, if I am plotting M on the X axis, so I have M plus A upon two mu A. So I can just separate this. So I can write this as M upon two U A plus A upon two U A. A is canceled for this one. So M is my variable on the X axis. One upon V is my variable on the Y axis. Right. So everything else with the quantity on the x-axis, one upon two UA, this is going to be my gradient. And for the y-intercept, so everything here, one upon two U is going to be my y-intercept. So one upon two U is my y-intercept. So on to the table of values. So values of M and T are given in table uh, 2.1. Calculate and record values of one upon V in table 2.1, where one upon V is T upon, uh, T upon L, and L is five plus or minus 0 0.1. So if you have to calculate one upon V, which is T upon L, so I have T along with its uncertainties. L also has some uncertainties and I need to calculate the absolute uncertainties in one upon V. So I can use the percentage uncertainty. So in this one, I have the times which would have all of these own percentage uncertainties. And I have L, uh, but L fortunately has a fixed percentage uncertainty. I can calculate that. So that would be 0.1 upon five times 100. So, so 0.1 times 100, then divide by five. So this has always a percentage uncertainty of 2%. Let's say I'm talking about the first value. So 0 0.01 upon 0 0.23 times 100. So this would give me the percentage uncertainty in uh, this time, so one upon 23 times 100. 
So this turns out to be 4.347, so 4.35%. So adding this and this together would give me the total percentage uncertainty in V or in one upon V, it's the same thing, right? So 6.35 would be the percentage uncertainty in this. So first let me calculate the actual value. So one upon V would be T upon L. So 0 0.23 upon five, this is in seconds per centimeter. So no conversion required. So 0 0.23 upon five. So all of this is in 2SF. This is in 2SF as well. So I can give this in 2SF or 3SF. So let's do two. So 0 0.046 is the principal value. And then I take 6.35% uh, of this. So 6.35% of 0 0.046. So this turns out to be, so this is 2.921 into 10 to the negative three. So 2.921, one, two, three. This would be, 0 0.002, right? So this is 0 0.0029, so this would be uh, 0 0.003, right? Just to one SF. Then I do the same thing for all the other values. So 0 0.01 upon 0 0.26 times 100, this is 3.84 plus two, is 5.84. So 5.84 percent of this value. So let me just write 5.84 here. So this is the final, not just uh, this one. This is uh, the total uncertainty, right? So 0 0.26 divided by 5 is 0 0.00 0 0.052. And then 5.84% of this. So this is 0 0.00303. So 0 0.003. Then this one, so 0 0.01 divided by 0 0.31 times 100. This is 3.22 plus the 2. So this has a total uncertainty of 5.22%. So T upon V is 0 0.31 upon 5. This is 0 0.062 plus or minus. So this 5.22% of this value, this is 0 0.00323, 0 0.003. Then the next one, So the total uncertainty turns out to be 4.78 in this case, percent. So 0 0.36 divided by five is 0 0.072. So 4.78% of this, 0 0.0, .0 Zero three four four so zero point zero zero three, right? Then the next value. So one upon forty times hundred plus two, so this is four point five percent of zero point four zero divided by five. This is zero point zero eight. But this is, uh, since this is going to be written to 2SF, I put another zero myself. So then 4.5% of this is 0 0.0036. This time this would be 0 0.004. And then the same thing. So one upon 44 times 100 plus two is 4.27% of 0 0.44 divided by five, which is 0 0.088. So 4.27% 
of 0 0.088 this is 0 0.00375 so this would also be 0 0.004 so that concludes the table of values. Now we go on to the graph. And for the graph, we have to plot the mass against uh, the time, right? So even though I don't want to, I would have to take the time as well. Include error bars for one upon V. So, So when the mass is 271, uh, the one upon V is 0 0.046. So 271 and 0 0.046. So first let's look at 270, so 250, 260, 270. So 271 would be more or less in the same position. And then if we talk about the Y axis, so 0 0.046. So this should be 0 0.046. So that this is seven, this is eight, this is nine, so then this is five. So that point is going to be here. So 270 and 0 0.046. And there are also error bars of plus or minus 0 0.03. So 0 0.03 would actually mean, so look at this. So seven, eight, and nine, right? So three would mean six boxes up and down. So one, two, three, four, five, six. So two, four, six. And then two, four, Looks like this. And then the circle around the point. And then you have the next one. So it's 369 and 0 0.052. So 369 is almost 370. So that would be along this line. And 0 0.052. So this would be 51, this would be 52. Right, and this is also plus or minus 0 0.03. So six and six boxes. So two, four, six. And then two, four, six. Four ninety and zero point zero six two. So four ninety would be this value. 
and 0 0.062. And this is also plus or minus 0 0.03. So six boxes above and below. Then you have 632. So let's shift this up, up a bit. So 632 and 0 0.072. somewhere here, and then plus or minus 0 0.03, as well in this case. And the last two points, so let's take this here now. So 741 and 0 0.080. So actually 741 and 0 0.080. That would be here. This is plus or minus 0 0.04. So this would be eight boxes now. So And then the last point, 840 and 0 0.088. So 86, 87, and 88 will be here. And this is also plus or minus 0 0.04. So let me just actually just copy these error bars. I don't know why I didn't think of this before. 
let me also right so these are all our points let's get rid of this now so now to draw the line of this fit And then let's try to realign this. So maybe something like this looks about correct. Then the, this is the line of best fit. And then the line of waist fit. So passing through all error bars, bottom of the first bar and the top of the last bar gives me the line of burst fit. Right, this is the steepest line. So now we would obviously need to calculate the gradient. So for the line of burst fit, I need two points. So one could be this point. This looks uh, exactly on the line. So this would be 330 and 0 0.05. So 330 and 0 0.05. And now we need another point. So let's try this point. This also looks uh, right on the line. So this would be 0 0.0875 because this is right in the middle. So 0 0.0875 and then this value, uh, which is two boxes from here. So 830 and 0 0.0875, right? So 830 and 0 0.0875 is this one. Let's calculate the gradient y2 minus y1 upon x2 minus x1. So 
0.0875 minus 0 0.050 upon 830 minus 330. This is 7.5 into 10 to the negative five. And then for the worst fit, so again, we still need two points. So you just pick these points. So this would be 0 0.094. No. Did I make a mistake with this point? No, this is right. But this would be, so this would be 0 0.091. This would be 0 0.092. So the last point is 840 and 0 0.092. And the other point, That could be this point. So this would be uh, 270 and 0 0.043, right? So 270 and 0 0.043. This is 8.596 into 10 to the negative 5. So actually, previously, what was the gradient turning out to be? This was exactly 7.5. But to just make this 3SF, or you can also keep this 2SF. So 7.50 into 10 to the negative 5. Or actually, let's just keep this 2SF because our, all our data is to 2SF as well. So you can keep this to 2SF. And then this was turning out to be 8.59 into 10 to the negative five. So this would be 8.6 into 10 to the negative five. So the gradient would be 7.5 and the uncertainty would be the difference between the two, which would be 1.1. And this is into 10 to the negative five. So this is done, let's go on to the next part. Let me share screen again. Determine the y-intercept of the line of best fit. Uh, for the line of best fit, if I think about this, this is my y-intercept, right? And that was a trick question because this isn't my y-intercept. Uh, no, just a second. 
Yeah, so this is my... All right, so this is not the y-intercept. Sorry, uh, got a bit distracted. So this is not the y-intercept because this is the point 200, right? So if this was the point zero, so then this would be the y-intercept. But this isn't the y-intercept because of the false origin. So here you would need to take these values and calculate the y-intercept from these. So 0, 0.0 is 875, y equals mx plus c. 0 0.0875 equals the gradient 7.5 to 10 to the negative 5. times 830 plus C. So the best fit y-intercept so 0 0.0875 is this thing turns out to be 0 0.00 just to two SF, this would be this. And then for the worst fit y intercept, so 0 0.043 y equals mx plus c, 0 0.043. So this was. 270. So this C turns out to be 0 0.01978, so 0 0.020. So the y-intercept would be 0 0.025 plus or minus the difference between the two. So would be 0 0.005. Use your answers to A, C3, and C4 determine values of U and A. Include appropriate units. So the gradient is 1 upon 2 U A, and this is 1 upon 2 U. Right, so the gradient uh, is one upon two UA. So the gradient was 7.5. So A is going to be one upon two U times the gradient. But still, uh, since we uh, don't know U yet, we can't calculate this. So first let's calculate U. So from this equation, the value of u would be one upon twice times the y-intercept. So one upon two times 0 0.025, one upon this. So u turns out to be 20. And then if you substitute 20 here, so one upon two times 20 times the value of the gradient, which is 7.5 into 10 to the negative five. This is 333 or just to two SF 330, right? And for the unit, so U was a velocity. So this is going to be meters per second. And if we talk about A, so 
is the mass of the glider, so this would be in grams, right? Because if you think about this, this mass was in grams. So this uh, mass that we calculated is also going to be in grams. Determine the percentage uncertainty in A. So the percentage uncertainty in A, if you think about it, so U was calculated from the y-intercept, right? So the percentage uncertainty in A would simply be the percentage uncertainty in U, which is just the percentage uncertainty in the y-intercept plus the percentage uncertainty in the gradient. So percentage uncertainty in A is percentage uncertainty y-intercept plus percentage uncertainty of the gradient, right? So This was 1.1 upon 7.5 for the gradient. This is 0 0.005 upon 0 0.025. And then you multiply this entire thing by 100. So 0 0.005 divided by 0. 0 0.025 plus 1.1 1 .1 upon 7.5 times 100. This turns out to be 34.67. So 34.7%. Or you can just write 35 as well because everything is 2SF. The experiment is repeated. Determine the mass M of the glider and the card when t has a value of 0 0.5. So the mass small m is what we need to get using this equation. So we know A, we know U as well now, and the mass M is what we need to find. So V, V is T upon L, right? This is what you need to remember. This is what we use in the table of values. So V is T upon L, and this is 2UA upon M plus A. So T upon L would be 0.5 upon this value L, which was in centimeters. So actually, <clears throat> I made a mistake with the units here, is that since this time was in second and distance was in centimeters, so this should also have been centimeters per second, right? So this T upon L is uh, 0 0.5. The T is 0 0.5, L was five, 2UA, so 2 times 20 times 330 upon M plus A, which is also 330. So from this, you can get the mass.
So M is turning out to be this for me. Again, this seems like a ridiculously large value, but again, uh, you don't get really, you really don't get marks for values. So you get marks for your uh, working, right? So don't be too concerned with this value. So that's it for this live session, guys. We looked at March 21, paper 52. And in the next one, uh, we are going to be looking at some papers from S21, summer 21. So thanks for your time and see you in the next session. Bye-bye.